Hello and welcome to Sports Night Live. You're with myself, Asa Clark, and this is the Book Club. And I'm joined by ex-West Ham, Everton, Leicester City striker Tony Cotty, who's got this new book out, Tony Cotty, West Ham, The Inside Story. Tony, how are you? I'm very good, Asa, thank you. Brilliant. OK, the book itself, West Ham, The Inside Story, is pretty self-explanatory, but mm. there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I'd done my, my first um, autobiography back in 1995, which covered, obviously, my early playing career, West Ham, Everton, and back to West Ham. And since 1995, which was 17 years ago, is a, an awful lot's happened. A lot of water's yeah. gone under the bridge. Um, and the second book here that I've done, it basically deals with coming to the end of my playing days, um, what I've been doing since I retired, and also dealing particularly with the West Ham takeover, which occurred in 2006. And mm. so it is, you know, it is heavily influenced by obviously what's gone on at West Ham, but it is a, is a general football book as well with some good stories in there. Fantastic. I mean, I read, read the book and, and obviously you're, you went for the, the takeover in mm. regards to West Ham. Mm. Looking back, it seemed like as there was many dramas involved in the yeah. club. What would you have done differently in regards to the takeover of the club? Is there anything you would have changed at all? I don't think really there was anything I could do differently. I mean, the, the problem I had, and, and I, I explained it in the book, was when I started, it was I was just a frustrated fan. You know, mm. there's so much had happened at the club. Um, and I just felt that I wanted to try and make things better. Um, now, if I'd have been a multi-millionaire, then obviously it would have been a lot easier for me because I could have done it all my own way. I could have made all the decisions, employed whoever I wanted, and done the whole deal myself. But the problem I had was I didn't have any money to put towards the, the consortium, so I had to really build it up from scratch. Yeah. Uh, and the point being really then is that once you then get you know, big money involved, and at the end of it, I mean, this was a takeover for £85 million. It wasn't a cheap takeover, it was a very expensive takeover, and I hadn't put any of the £85 million in, so quite rightly, the people that got involved at the end, you know, if they decide they don't want a certain person, unfortunately that was me, then that's their choice. But when you haven't got the money, then you're always at the mercy of a big businessman. Mm. Okay. In regards to the actual, um, in regards to the to the take and everything else, there was certain people who were coming into the club that mm -hmm. eventually kind of took away your kind of your kind of project, Ignat Magnuson mm -hmm. being one of them. Mm -hmm. Looking back, did you look on and just worry as soon as this guy came in, who you who you said in this book you never even heard of? No. I mean, I hadn't heard of the guy. Um, I mean, with the takeover, I mean, if I explain, I started from absolute scratch, but literally a fan who used to be a footballer, um, not had a great deal of uh, business dealings in the business world. And I started from scratch. I had to put the whole consulting together. I, I had an accountant friend of mine who helped me to obviously do all the figures. We had to form a, a business plan so that when we went to see people, they knew exactly what we was talking about. And uh, I think it's fair to say at the start, as you would have read, we yeah. was a bit all over the place at the start, but yeah. we gradually got there and it gradually became very professional. And in the end, I got some very, very good people involved in, in the uh, consortium, but we was always missing the, the major investor, someone who would put the bulk of the money in. I've already mentioned 85 million pounds. I needed someone who could put 30 or 40 million pounds in. I couldn't find them. And eventually when I did find them, that was the Icelandic bank, uh, Landsbanki. And, um, and the guy who they nominated as their sort of front man as such really was, was Egert Magnusson, who uh, eventually went on and become the sort of the chief executive of West Ham Football Club. But as soon as he got involved, I think he felt that he didn't need a football person like me. He knew everything about football, mm. which quite obviously he didn't because he, you can see all the mistakes he made at the club. Yeah. But once he got involved, then he felt or they felt that they didn't need me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they, he literally <coughs> kind of went out and just spent a bucketload of money on players, mm. on long-term wages that really, you know, pe players like Freddie Lundberg mm. on 80, rumoured to be eighty-five thousand yep. pound a week, and you think at the time, wow, this 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 club's going places. This man is literally promising to the fans what he said he had come to do. He'd bring all the players he could, mm. but it was kind of like you reading the book and reading the reports on it. It seemed like as though it was going to come to an end at some point. Yeah, I think. Um I, I honestly believe that they had all the best intentions, and you know when when I was told that the the, the bank was coming to the table, you know this was a bank that on on paper was worth two to three billion pounds, billion, not million, two wow. to three billion pounds. But unfortunately, it was only it was only on paper. It was all paper assets. It wasn't the cash that really that you know. I mean, I think if you look at Roman Abramovich, for example, there's a lot more cash involved with him than mm. paper money and um, I think the Icelandics had the they had all the best intentions, the right intentions. They wanted to 
make a statement of intent. They wanted to say, look, we are West Ham Football Club, we're going to buy big players and that. I mean, obviously, uh, some of the players were injured that they bought. Some of the players they bought, like Freddie Lundberg, you mentioned, big wages and never really done it for the club. And in the end, I think they gave him £5 million just to leave. So it was a very, very expensive mistake. Um, but they had the best intentions, but I don't believe they had anyone with any football uh, intelligence, if you like, who could make a call and say, look, why are you paying that sort of money mm. for Freddie Lundberg? Why are you giving those sort of wages? And yeah. they, fe they felt they knew best. And... You know, I, I was looking, saying that I don't believe that you know best. You need a football um, person involved in the board. And the whole point when I put the consortium together, I said, you must have a football influence. But they felt they knew better, and, of course, they discarded me. And I think I was proved right because of the mistakes they made. But that was that they had the money. They could do what they wanted. Yeah, it, I mean, it seems nowadays that... You, I couldn't understand why someone like, you look at West Ham with Egan Magnuson, yep. Blackburn with the Venkies, mm. why don't they have football people involved? It seems the most easiest solution to have someone who knows mm. the club inside out, yep. who knows players, who knows on what people should be earning, and giving players sort of the wages that they, they were given and mm. sign on fees, it seems absolutely astronomical. And why, why didn't they? Why didn't they say to you, do you know what, you know the club inside out, we want you on board? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't know what went on from the point that Eggert got involved up until when they took over, took over the club. I know that the former chairman at West Ham, Terry Brown, had a personal issue with me. Um, I don't think he felt that I was the right man to be involved at the club for whatever reason. I don't think he felt that I had the money, which obviously personally I didn't, but I did bring the right people to the table. I don't know why, but they made a decision. You, you mentioned West Ham, you mentioned Blackburn. There's many, many other clubs out there where they have got a board of directors of six, seven, eight, nine, some in some cases, and these are all very, very good businessmen, but they've got no one with any football um, background. And I, I find it staggering that you would have a board of directors that are running a football club and not have anyone to give advice to that board. You know, if you said to some of these guys, if they're running, I don't know, a double glazing outfit for example yeah. you know it's like saying well we haven't got anyone who's fitted any windows or knows anything about double glazing <laughs> we're going to get seven businessmen we're going to make decisions about double glazing but we've we've never we've got no experience of it and why you know it's the same principle with football why would you make decisions that involve millions and millions of pounds without having mm. some sort of football input that's what i found frustrating that's what i knew i could bring to the table but as i say i can't unless i could get egg at magnuson to sit there where you are now and ask <laughs> him i can't answer the question yeah no that's fair enough so you said in regards to the football clubs and the experience and football people do you see the new ownership under David Gold and David mm. Sullivan, also run by Karen Brady. Mm. Do you feel that that's a kind of, that West Ham are now finally, after all these years, are in the right direction? They've got, they've technically, they're, they're fans of the club, they've run a football club uh, in Birmingham City, mm -hmm. and surely they're, now they're the right people to kind of take the club forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, it was a pretty horrific spell that the club went, up, went through, and, and obviously, <laughs> unfortunately, I've got to take responsibility for that because I was the ones who brought the Icelandics to the table, albeit with the, the best intentions, but the fallout from when they, you know, when the bank went bankrupt, um, it then went into a holding company, and the club was at, literally teetering on the brink of, of going into administration before David Gold and David Sullivan took over the club. You mentioned they are fans of the club. You know, I, I know both the Davids, and I, I honestly believe that they have got the right intention, the best intentions for the club. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, surrounding the Olympic Stadium at the moment, but I think you know the, these guys are the only ones. When when the push came to the shove in 2010, because there was a four-year gap from the Icelandic takeover to David Gold and David Sullivan buying the club, during that four years, you know, they they there was a lot going on, and they was the only ones in 2010 who went there's our money, we are going to buy West Ham United Football Club and uh, I could say we'll have to wait and see what happens with the Olympic Stadium but I, I honestly believe that they are the right uh, owners for the club at the moment going forward but I think even David Sullivan's on record as saying if you know, a big prince from the Middle East comes in with millions and millions of pounds and they can do yeah. to the club what maybe Dave, Dave, the two Davids can't do, I'm sure they would step to one side but you never know, I mean uh, look at what's gone on at Manchester City, what's, look what's happened at Chelsea, um, you know many other clubs, I think Leeds are just about to be taken over so mm. there's a, always a lot going on in football but as we stand at the moment they, they are the right owners for the club. Okay, do you feel with the Olympic Stadium though, you did touch on that, mm. the Olympic Stadium is going to catapult West Ham into kind of the next kind of the, the big clubs, I mean if this ha stadium happens it will be the second largest stadium in London bar obviously excluding Wembley, mm -hmm. but for club-wise, how much will that benefit them? 
I think it'd be a massive benefit to the club. Um, you know, I think uh, for my dream is, and I've touched on it in the book, my dream is for West Ham to compete and, and try and be in the Champions League. Mm. I think any West Ham fan who's maybe watching this show would love to see West Ham one day, even if it's just one season, just see them in the Champions League. Now, to be involved in the Champions League, you need money and you obviously need the stadium infrastructure sure. to, to make the club bigger. Um, I look at our great competitors, Tottenham Hotspur, who are, at the moment are on a very similar foot into West Ham. They've got a ground of 36,000, exactly the same. You know, they've had some good managers over the years and they've gradually built that football club up to the point where they've had Champions League football and should have had it again this season, all bar you know, Chelsea winning the Champions League. So, you know, if, I think if Tottenham can do it, I think if Chelsea can do it, because historically Chelsea was a smaller club than West Ham mm -hmm. before they had the injection of money. Arsenal are probably the biggest club in London. But the, I think the thing with all those three clubs, Arsenal have got the 60,000 all-seater, Tottenham are moving to the 60,000 all-seater, mm -hmm. and Chelsea, given the chance and finding a bit of land, will definitely move to a 60,000 all-seater. So in five years' time, those three clubs will, will probably have their grounds, and I want West Ham to have that ground as well. I don't know how long it's going to take to get to the Olympic Stadium, whether West Ham will actually get the Olympic Stadium, but for them to go on to the next level, you have to have a, a bigger ground, a bigger fan base and a bigger club in general and, and I think the support there is a massive club West Ham and I think that there's there's room for four big London clubs and I think West Ham you know need to be amongst it. Okay brilliant okay well after the break uh, we'll be taking a little trip down memory lane with Tony in regards to his Leicester City days and also what he thinks on the future of Leicester City as well. Back to you in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the book club at Sports Night Live. You have myself, Asa Clark, and also Tony Cotty. Now, Tony was speaking before the break about West Ham, and funny enough, this is what we're going to come to now in regards to a little trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. What was it like playing for West Ham back in the day? It was fantastic. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a West Ham fan. I was born in West Ham. My parents, grandparents, great-grandparents are uh, West Ham fans, so I was told to support the club. I didn't have any choice in it. I was just told to support West Ham, which was great. I had some great years in the 70s and the 80s where West Ham were winning trophies. And then, of course, to finally make my debut in 1983 as a 17-year-old against Tottenham and score the first goal, win 3-0. Win mm. It was just a dream come true and, uh, you know, fantastic. I, I can't be. I could sit here all day and talk about it, you know, um, you know how great it was, but just a wonderful, wonderful time for me to make my debut for the club. Fantastic. Well, when you said at 17, you were kind of, if you don't mind me saying, you're kind of a young prodigy sort of thing, coming mm. through the game, yep. and there's a lot of talk about you as well. Mm. Nowadays, there's also a lot of talk about young players. Mm. As soon as they score the goal and make their debut, mm. they're sort of kind of taken from, from yeah. the youth team and given loads of wages and things like that. Mm. What do you think has changed in regards to the way players were, young players were then mm. and young players are now? So glad you put that picture up of me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrific <laughs> picture of me, but I was only 21 there. But I think the difference is is, is the money side of it, really, isn't it? I think um, you know when I made uh, my debut, I, I, I think through through memory, I was on about 100 pound a week, which was still decent money in those days. But I think nowadays with the players, I think there's so much uh, build up for them. They're sort of almost like superstars before they've actually played, you know, five games mm. really, and. Uh, you know, you, you play one game, you get, you know, if, if, if a youngster plays for West Ham now in the first team, they play one game, score a goal, and then the next Tony Cotty, which, you know, I, I don't think is fair on players, although I, I was going to be the next Jimmy Greaves. That was who, who I was compared with. Now, it's Jimmy, not a bad comparison. Well, Jimmy <laughs> Greaves is just one of the most legendary goal scorers ever in English football, so it was, you know, but it, it, it puts pressure on you. But I think nowadays with, with the youngsters, because there's so much money involved in football, I think you've got to be very careful with them. And I think you've got to keep their feet on the floor because otherwise if they play their five games in the first team and then they're driving around in a brand new BMW or whatever it might be, you know, they can get a bit carried away with it. I think that the most important thing is to, to get on with your football, keep your head down, listen to the to the experienced managers and coaches and that. And I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson is the best example, you know, mm. what he's done with Ryan Giggs and David Beckham, Paul Scholes and managed to keep them as just such grounded, nice people, mm. but have the outstanding careers they've got. And I think that's the key to it. But football's changed. I mean, you know, as we sit here now, I mean, I made my debut 1983. I joined the club in 1981, so it was over 30 years ago. And if you yeah. try and compare anything in football uh, now, 
compared to when I started it, you, you just can't compare. Everything's changed and everything's different and everything's better. Well, so you touched on Sir Alex Ferguson in regards yeah. to the younger players. When you got brought back to Leicester City by Martin O'Neill, yep. he had kind of like the, a raw kind of team. Mm -hmm. Some players who were coming, maybe not to the end of their careers, but they were kind of they were on the brink of something. Yep. What was he like as a manager? It was fantastic. I mean, obviously Martin's the, the Sunderland manager now, and uh, you know I'm, I'm a huge fan. He's done brilliant at, at Celtic, Aston Villa, and during my time at Leicester. And I think what I what I appreciated about Martin, and not just for me, but the other players that were at the club. Was he gave players a chance, you know? Mm. I mean, I was isolated. I was out in Malaysia. No one wanted to touch me. No one wanted me to play Premier League football. But Martin O'Neill, he gave me a chance, and he did the same. Like Muzzy Izzet was in the reserves at Chelsea, and Neil Lennon was at Crew Alexandra. Robbie Savage yeah. was at Crew Alexandra. Stan Collymore had a lot of problems, and no one wanted to take a chance. Martin gave Stan a chance, you know. So, I think he's very open-minded with players. He's still like it now, and you know, he he believes that everyone deserves a chance. You give them the chance, but one thing, if you do the business for Martin O'Neill, he keeps you in the team, he'll play you and he'll back you 100%. Mm. But he's a wonderful, wonderful motivator. I mean, you know, I've touched on a few of the great managers I've played for in the book, but, you know, in terms of motivating players, Martin O'Neill is right up there. Do you reckon then that he'll, he could go on further from Sunderland? So, for example, a team like Liverpool mm. or like a Manchester United, for example, because he seems to have all the qualities there. Mm. He's not really given a lot of money mm. and it makes you wonder, could he do a better job at, no offence to Sunderland, but a bigger club? Well, I'm surprised Martin's not been given the chance. I think in the past he's been linked with Liverpool. I mean, there's obviously always speculation about who will take over from Sir Alex Ferguson. You know, could Martin handle the pressure? Could he do the job at Manchester United? I honestly believe he could. You know, he, he was interviewed for the England job about five or six years ago. So I think a couple of times he's been very close to getting one of the big clubs. And, you know, I, 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 it can only be a matter of time, really. You know, if he carries on doing the wonderful jobs he's been doing at all the different clubs. It can only be a matter of time before he gets a chance at one of the big clubs. Exactly. Brilliant. Also as well, it, it says in your book um, about your days at Barnet. Mm -hmm. Now you say that you know, it wasn't your, exactly your best time, it mm -hmm. was kind of your cutting your teeth in management. Yep. How did it feel when you were at Barnet and you were a young player, mm -hmm. or a young manager I say, kind of playing and managing? How did it feel to have all these ideas thrust upon you because you said in there you didn't mind taking all the ideas at first mm -hmm. and then you kind of thought actually this is too much yeah well I think you have to be your own man and uh, I mean the problem was is that I was only 35 years of age at the time I was player manager as well I mean it's hard enough being a manager as well as doing the playing and you know describing the book how one game I had to do absolutely everything you know on the day I was doing the press interviews talking to the chairman team talks you know I've mm. done everything except pour the tea I think that day it was it was <laughs> a really really tough job um, but you know I think I, I was willing to learn you know there was people at the club that I was willing to learn off of that uh, you know as I went along but I um, I got to the stage where I'm thinking well you know I, I don't think I'm really learning here I need to be my own man but I, I think I, I got caught between uh, I wasn't really playing to the best of my ability and I wasn't managing to the best of my ability and I've been very self-critical here and I think looking back I, I probably wasn't quite ready for the job you know but mm. I'd always wanted to be a manager you know my careers officer when I sat down at the age of 13 and and she said to me what are you going to be when you when you leave school I said I'm going to be a footballer and she said oh no one's ever become a footballer you know you'll never be a <laughs> footballer you know what about if you break your leg what are you going to do then I said I'll be a manager and that was my <laughs> reply so I was very Sort of, I always wanted to be a manager. I believed that I had the qualities to become a manager, but unfortunately, I took the Barnet job, and it was the it was the wrong club at the wrong time. I perhaps should have been a, a number two or a coach, um, you know, a bit like what I don't know what Steve Bowles done at Arsenal, yeah. for example. You know, he's he's gone through the youth system. He's now the assistant manager to Arsene Wenger, and if Arsene Wenger leaves, he might well become the manager. So perhaps I should have gone down that route. But you know, you live and learn. I mean, by by not achieving in the uh, the managerial side of things of football it gave me the chance to work for Sky and I've had a great time working for them as well. Sure well in the, in the book also you're if you don't mind me saying you're quite mm -hmm. critical of the FA in regards to when you went to the the coaching mm -hmm. uh, the coaching lessons now what do you see needs to happen to, because in England mm -hmm. we're seen as having not many coaches at all you look at Germany look at Spain the, the mm -hmm. thousands and thousands they've yep. got why aren't we producing as many coaches in the UK? I think you've got to coach the coaches, really, haven't you? That's the main thing. And uh, you know, I think over the last 10, 20 years, maybe 25 years, I think, unfortunately, the coaching philosophy, particularly for youngsters, has not been very good. Um, you know, For example, I think, I believe, personally, the best learning age, really, is 
seven to 12 years of age, that's the real learning curve yeah. where you're at an age, you can take in what the manager or the coach is saying and you're taught the game and you learn how the game uh, develops. I think the best thing that's happened to football over the last five years particularly has been Barcelona because mm. we all sit and admire the wonderful players they've got, the likes of Lionel Messi and Iniesta and Xavi and all those great players and that, but they play football the right way. Yeah. And I think what's happened now is a lot of people in England have looked at how Barcelona play, you know, the coaches, managers, players, and they're all saying, we want to play like Barcelona. Not everyone can do that because we've not all True. got all the players. But what you can do is you can get the coaches to teach the kids. You know, the, the, the mentality we've got in kids' football is the most important thing is to win 12-0. And that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to learn how to become a footballer. You know, learn to treasure the ball. You know, when you're in possession, don't give the ball away. Work mm. on your skills. You know, and develop all those. And that's what we need to do with our kids. But so many managers over the last few years have been just talking about how tall and how quick they are, and you know, can we kick it down the pitch as quick as possible? Mm. And hope, you know, we need the attitude to change. And I believe a lot more should come from the FA. They are changing. They have tried. There's a lot of rules and stuff that come in to place over the last couple of years. It's taken a long time. They are getting there, but it needs to be fast-tracked to make sure that we can start competing with the likes of Spain and Argentina and Brazil. OK. And you also said that every team models themselves, or trying to model themselves on Barcelona. Mm -hmm. With West Ham, they've always had a way of playing yep. the West Ham way. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that with Sam Allardyce, the way that they play, it's not exactly, I would say, long ball, but they do keep the ball when need be. Do you think that's the way to go forward with West Ham? Well, I think <clears throat> Sam's got um, a particular style that he believes in. Um, you know, I've already said how much I love Barcelona, but I also believe there's room in the English game particularly for, for different types of football. Um, at the moment, we've got a very good centre forward called Andy Carroll, who you know, also plays for England as well. Yeah. Um, you know, Liverpool wanted to play a certain style, didn't want to play to Andy's strengths. Sam's got his way of playing and he's bought Andy Carroll in and if West Ham plays to Andy Carroll's strengths then he's an asset. So why would you not want to utilise the asset? You've got to get the balance right. You mentioned the West Ham style of play, the West Ham way. Um, you know, I think that there is a special way that the fans want to see their football played. But as Sam quite rightly said, you know, wh where has it got West Ham? They haven't mm. won anything for 32 years now. It's a long, long time. So uh, you've got to get the balance right. I, I don't believe West Ham can play like Barcelona because we haven't got the players. But I think if we can get a mix of how Sam wants the game played, try and have a bit of good football with Barcelona, blend them together, mm. get the best out of Andy Carroll and Kevin Nolan as well, then I think you've got a West Ham team, as we've already seen recently, they're in the top ten and they're doing really, really well. So, you know, you, know, you can't criticise what Sam's trying mm. to do at the club. Do you reckon they'll stay up this season? Absolutely, yeah. And I said that. Not, I'm not sitting here smugly after, what, 10, 11 games. I honestly believed at the start of the season when people were asking me, where do you think West Ham will finish? I said, I think they'll finish mid-table. I think they've got some really good players. That was before Andy Carroll signed. I said Kevin Nolan would score goals. You've got James Tompkins, James Collins at the back, Winston Reid have done really well. They signed Jasko Leinen to replace Rob yeah. Green. There's some really good players at the club. And I, and I believe that they would finish mid-table. I think you know anything above 10th position, I think you know the fans will be absolutely delighted with. But for their first season back in the Premier League, they'd done it last time they got promoted. Mm. Under Alan Pardew, they finished, I think it was ninth and got yeah. to the FA Cup final. And I think the fans would certainly take a mid-table finish. But West Ham United Football Club needs stability. We've already spoke about the takeovers, the, the, all the turmoil at the club, um, the Carlos Tevez affair that's, that West yeah. Ham are still paying for. There's so much gone, over the, gone on over the last six, seven years. They need stability. And I think in Sam Allardyce, I think they've got a manager and the current owners that can settle everything down and let West Ham just develop nicely as a club. And we can see the outcome of the Olympic Stadium as well. Fantastic. Great stuff. Well, thanks very much to Tony. Thank you, Asa. You've been through to Sports Night Live and this is The Book Club. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to Sports Night Live. You're with myself, Asa Clark, and this is The Book Club. And I'm joined by ex-West Ham, Everton and Leicester City striker Tony Cotty, who's got this new book out, Tony Cotty, West Ham, The Inside Story. Tony, how are you? I'm very good, Asa, thank you. Brilliant. OK, the book itself, West Ham, The Inside Story, is pretty self-explanatory, but mm. there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'd done my, my first um, autobiography back in 1995, which covered got involved at the end. You know, if they decide they don't want a certain person, unfortunately that was me, then that's their choice. But when you haven't got the money, then you're always at the mercy of a big businessman. Mm. 
Okay. In regards to the actual, um, in regards to the to the take and everything else, there was certain people who had come into the club that mm -hmm. eventually kind of took away your kind of your kind of project, Ignat Magnuson mm -hmm. being one of them. Mm -hmm. Looking back, did you look on and just worry as soon as this guy came in who you... Obviously my early playing career, West Ham, Everton and back to West Ham and since 1995, which was 17 years ago, is a, an awful lot's happened. A lot of water's yeah. gone under the bridge. Um, and the second book here that I've done, it basically deals with coming to the end of my playing days, um, what I've been doing since I retired and also dealing particularly with the West Ham takeover which occurred in 2006 and mm. so there's you know it's heavily influenced by obviously what's gone on at West Ham but it is a is a general football book as well with some good now if I'd have been a multi-millionaire then obviously it would have been a lot easier for me because I could have done it all my own way I could have made all the decisions employed whoever I wanted and done the whole deal myself but the problem I had was I didn't have any money to put towards the, the consortium so I had to really build it up from scratch yeah. Uh, and the point being really then is that once you then get you know big money involved and at the end of it I mean this was a takeover for 85 million pounds it wasn't a cheap takeover it was a very expensive takeover and I hadn't put any of the 85 million in so quite rightly the people that got stories in there fantastic I mean I read read the book and and obviously you you went for the the takeover mm. in regards to West Ham mm. looking back it seemed like as there was many dramas involved in the yeah. club what would you have done differently in regards to the takeover of the club is there anything you would have changed at all I don't think really there was anything I could do differently I mean the the problem I had and and I, I explained it in the book was when I started it was I was just a frustrated fan you know mm. there's so much had happened at the club um, and I just felt that I wanted to try and make things better. Um, 